then we are coming to the last uh, presentation for today. Um, it's Dave Pattern, who is going to talk about uh, his, his experiences with uh, APIs, APIs. And uh, yeah, Dave is uh, yeah. a proud Shamprarian. If you don't know what a Shamprarian is, just Google it. Um, I think he likes uh, cats and gin. No, not really. Beer, <laughs> cake, and uh, he's doing actually he's doing over hours now, and he already because we in the program it said it would finish at five, and he already suggested moving his talk um, to the next pub. But I hope I can convince him to to stay here <laughs> if I bring him a beer. He That's said he would, he would, he would yeah. give presentations for beer, so um, I hope that this is an additional oh, wow. um, my, motivation. My, my first time at Elag, I'm going to come again if I get beer every time. It's brilliant. Sure, you always will come. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Again, I'm another blue spot Elag uh, delegate, uh, so it's really exciting to be here. Um, I kind of wasn't too sure how to pitch this presentation. Uh, it's to make it really geeky and nerdy. Um, and then kind of saw as well, like the very end of the day, I kind of thought, you're going to be, you're going to be so tired and stuff. And I tried, so I've tried to make a slightly fun presentation. I'm not going to be too, go into kind of too much technical details about APIs and that kind of thing. Um, and I kind of wanted to give the presentation a theme. Uh, so I kind of came up with basing it on the good, the bad, and the ugly. I was kind of tempted to try and get you all to sing the theme tune and whistle it, but probably, yay. <laughs> But that's not the best idea. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about how we've used, how we've developed some reading list software at University of Huddersfield. I'll explain what reading list software is, um, just for those of you not familiar with it. Um, but it was a kind of project where we had maybe, um, I think, a six-month time window, and maybe kind of one developer day a week. So I think kind of when I added up, it was about probably about a month's worth of developer days to kind of create a bit of software for the library. Um, so we kind of needed all the help we could get, and um, so we kind of looked for everywhere for APIs to try and make life a little bit easier for doing the development work. So that's essentially what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so Once Upon a Time in the West, a great film. Uh, sorry. Um, Once Upon a Time in West Yorkshire, which is where Huddersfield is. Um, university had a lot of courses that we taught, um, nothing new there, and each course was made up of many modules. And each of those modules, well, nearly all of them, had a list of things that the students were expected to read. Um, so that might be required reading for the module. It could be books, mostly books, journal articles. And then maybe kind of background reading to kind of expand on the subject area. Um, and that's kind of very, very common in the UK. Um, but kind of, there were a few things that were bad. And some of these are generalizations, because um, I might get beaten up by some of my colleagues for, for saying some of these things. So the bad. Sometimes academics wouldn't actually check if the library had access to the things they were putting on their reading lists. Um, so they might be quoting articles that we don't subscribe to. They may be quoting chapters in books that are long out of print that we're going to be really struggling to buy. Um, something else that's bad. Um, when academics do put books on their reading list, sometimes they don't update to the latest edition. That can be bad sometimes. Another thing that's bad. Um, and this was actually amazingly embarrassing. I mean, it's very, very similar. Every UK academic library I've ever talked to, they struggle to actually get hold of the physical copy of the reading list. Um, I think sometimes academics perhaps imagine the library has like a crystal ball and they can somehow figure out what's going to be on the reading list. Um, so that's when things start to get ugly. Students get very angry when they discover that they've got to read these things to succeed on their module, that the library is not providing them. And you know, we would if we knew about it. Um, maybe we've kind of bought a copy of a book because it looked good, um, but we didn't know it was on a reading list for 300 students. Suddenly they're all coming in to try and get the one copy. That leads to a lot of bad student feedback. Um, there's uh, kind of national surveys in the UK. Uh, quite often library, the feedback the library gets is not enough books. It's often down to the fact we didn't know we needed more copies to, to support the students. So maybe it's kind of time for the library to kind of step up and be the good guy. Um, yes, yeah, so I got no linked data, but I got a lot of bullet holes in this presentation. It took me ages to kind of animate there. 
Um, so we um, decided this kind of reading list software you can go out and buy, um, but for a lot of the stuff we wanted it to do, and this is kind of going back a few years, we kind of felt we could probably do something better in-house. Um, so we launched it uh, summer of 2011. Uh, it's been incredibly successful. Um, it's always a challenge to get academics to engage uh, with any kind of software the library kind of pushes onto them. Uh, so we're very, very lucky to have um, all the way from kind of the top from the uh, kind of top levels of the university kind of um, they were telling academics they needed to use the software to improve the student experience. So we kind of had like the top down, which was really, really useful. Um, so we've got almost every module now has a reading list on the software. And touch wood, um, academics are using, most of them have engaged and used the software. Uh, so it's been a really kind of fun project. It's been fairly successful. Um, I'm not going to do a demo. This is kind of very quickly what it looks like. It's not that exciting. It's just a list of references that the student on this module is expected to read and then kind of supplementary material they might want to read. Student kind of clicks on them and gets to kind of see extra links. So we've got things like the ebook available for them to look at, um, or we've got free uh, print copies in the library. So that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, we have a number of requirements, and we did a lot of um, kind of talking to academics to see what they wanted, talking to students to see what they wanted. Uh, we were kind of very keen to kind of move on to the online world and make as much available as we possibly could. Um, so it's kind of a one click away on the list. Um, crucially for the library, we get the information about what we need to buy. Um, it's given us a huge wealth of data to play with. It's not big data, but it's incredibly useful data for the library. Um, it's brilliant for if we need to cancel a journal subscription, we can very quickly check to see if it's actually a journal that's on reading list. Will it have an impact on students if we cancel um, that particular package? We wanted to automate as much as possible. Like a lot of libraries, we've been having cuts in the budget. Uh, so we don't have staff to throw up problems anymore. So we need to automate as much as possible. Um, the key thing is we needed to make it as simple as possible for academics to use. They've got a lot of things they need to be doing with their time, and messing about with updating reading lists on complicated software is not going to be good. So we needed to make it as easy to use as possible. And we wanted to integrate as much as possible with the other systems that we have, the corporate systems within the university and the library. So. A lot of that came down to using APIs, uh, being able to get hold of data from other systems, repurpose it, reuse it again. Uh, if you're not familiar with APIs, then I've got kind of a few examples we can run through. Um, and when I was kind of thinking about putting the presentation together, the APIs kind of fell into kind of good APIs, bad APIs, and ugly APIs, which is kind of where the presentation title came from. So some of the good ones. Um, so it kind of feels like we're doing kind of a big kind of cheerleading session for someone today. Um, but someone was brilliant because it, it provided us with our kind of delivery platform for the software. Um, and I'll kind of explain how that works. We had a number of issues that we tried to kind of needed to address. And the primary one was a lot of academics use Microsoft Word for updating a reading list, which is obviously easy for them to do. Um, but it means it's kind of not necessarily a document that links to anything. The student then has to kind of try and find where they can access the, the materials on, on there. So that was really the challenge, to try and make something that was as easy, if not easier, than updating uh, a Word document. Um, again, the trouble with Word documents, it's the metadata. Um, the references might be very, very basic, and you kind of might just be a book title, and kind of, you know, who wrote it? You know, kind of is it, which edition was it? So we need to try and get really accurate metadata, and we, also, because it's obviously the online software, we wanted reliable full text links to go with that. So using Summon, we were able to kind of find a backdoor into the Summon interface. Um, so uh, using jQuery, we were able to kind of hack into the Summon interface and start dropping things in for academics. And I'll, I've got a couple of screenshots to show you. Um, within our own Summon collection, we've got around about 130 million items. Um, so academics can very quickly kind of see what we have access to now. But they can go and kind of search beyond and see the full Summon Index and get access to nearly 800 million items. Um, so hopefully, pretty much anything they want to add to a reading list will be in Summon. We might not necessarily subscribe to it today, um, but if they can add it, then we get to know. So this is what our Summon interface looks like if you're an academic. Uh, so I've done a search there for things to do in Ghent. Um, I don't think there are any peer-reviewed articles, which that's a little bit of a shame. But um, what academics have, once they've logged in, 
is they get a very kind of quick and easy link so they can find the article, they can find the book, whatever it is. Click on a button and in the background, we fire off a request to the Summit API which returns the metadata for that particular result. And in turn, that's kind of what the academic sees next. They see a pre-populated form with hopefully very accurate metadata. We're capturing things like the open URL, which is quite important. I'll explain why in a couple of minutes. And then another couple of mouse clicks, and that adds it onto their reading list. Um, so it becomes a very quick process um, for academics to update reading lists. Um, here we've got another example. And again, we're able to use the API. So this is a student looking at the reading list. Using the API, we can start pulling in things like the subject terms for that particular article. Uh, so if a student wants to go and search consumer behavior, they can click on that link and they're back into someone doing a subject scope search on that particular topic. And we can also kind of add value by bringing in things like the abstract. Um, so again, these are kind of done on the fly. Um, so if we ever got rid of someone, this kind of stuff functionality we'd lose because we'd lose access to the API. Second thing that's been really, really useful uh, is XISBN from OCLC, which is um, basically kind of an API that allows you to start linking different editions of books together. And the issues that we had were, as I mentioned before, academics don't necessarily know there's a new edition as a book available. Um, whereas the library, if we know it's a popular book, we tend to keep an eye out and buy the latest editions. Um, so we need to kind of tie those things together. Um, so using XISBN, we're able to kind of um, just fire off a quest, fire out, find out which different editions are available. Um, maybe there are new editions that the library hasn't bought yet, and we can alert the library that this particular really popular book with a new edition coming out. Um, but within the interface, we can start linking different editions together. And again, I've got a screenshot of that. So we've got a book here from 2005, Fashion Brands. And the library has actually bought a newer edition, 2008. Uh, so within the student view of the reading list, we can say, yeah, fine, we've got the electronic book for the 2005 edition. You might want to look at that. But if you want to physically borrow the book, it doesn't need to be the 2005 edition necessarily. We've got the 2008 that you might want to borrow as well. Um, when the academic logs into the software and looks at their reading list, they kind of see some extra things, including a note from the library saying, hey, we've bought the 2008 edition. Um, if they want to update, that's just a mouse click to update the entire reference to the latest edition. Uh, number three has been the link resolver. Um, so we use 360 Link, uh, again from Sil Solutions. Uh, and yeah, the issue is linking to anything on the web is a pain in the ass. Um, getting persistent links that will last over time to articles, that's pretty much impossible. We can't expect probably only kind of two, three, three people in the library who understand how URL, URLs work for um, a lot of the e-resources. Um, so the things are things like embedded session IDs where the link will work for maybe 20 minutes and then suddenly the link stops working. All the kind of stuff to do with authentication, easy proxy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I kind of don't know if I should admit to this on camera, um, but I've heard, maybe at other universities, maybe not at ours, because of all these issues of kind of linking to the full text accurately, academics feel it's a lot easier just to download a PDF, stick it in a virtual learning environment, and you really can't blame them. That's completely, completely naughty. Um, so that's kind of stuff we wanted to try and get around. Um, and the fact that library subscriptions keep changing, journal platforms keep changing, URLs keep changing. We've bought a link resolver. That's what link resolver does. So let's try and get some value from it. Um, and Pretty much every link resolver I know has an API of some kind. Um, so we're able to use 360 Link API to just find out where it is today that we've got access to that particular article. So the keen-eyed amongst you, when I added that article about Ghent, might have spotted there was an open URL that we captured at that moment in time. So because we've got the open URL uh, as part of that record, we can keep on checking where have we got access to this particular article today. And um, we can kind of bring that in live for the students. So, this particular article we've got access today at Oxford Journal's Humanities Collection. But the other thing to do is really, really useful is detect when we don't have access or if we lose access to an article. Um, so this particular article where maybe it's kind of freely available, so we kind of put in links to Google Scholar. So if a student wants to, they can kind of go off and try and track this article down on the web. 
But what happens in the background is the library gets alerted that we no longer have access to this. this we make this a priority. Uh, we try to figure out if we can scan um, a copy of the article under the terms of the copyright licensing agency's um, license. Um, but it's kind of just an alert that something's gone wrong. We need to kind of fix this link as quickly as possible. Uh, number four, COPAC, which is a union catalog in the UK. Again, they have a really good API. Um, so maybe kind of one of the use case scenarios that we identified was academics often have the books they want on their reading list on their shelf in their office, and they want to be able to add those items really quickly. Um, short of kind of buying them a barcode scanner, the quickest way is just to kind of type an ISBN um, into the software, and in the background, that goes off and looks at various places. Um, so it looks at Copac, uh, also looks at Amazon, and there's a whole bunch of uh, modules uh, for Perl developers, uh, kind of under, under that branch, which all just kind of search different places, fire up an ISBN, try and get some metadata back. Uh, number five, which is the last one I'm gonna show you, is uh, for DOIs, and I think it's probably kind of a rare use case scenario. Um, but if an academic, maybe they're looking at an article on Science Direct that they then want to add to um, their reading list, maybe it's kind of quicker for them just to be able to kind of copy and paste the DOI from the page into the software. And in the background, um, sorry, in the background, we can use the um, Crossref API just to get the metadata for that DOI uh, and just populate the reference for them. So those are the good ones, uh, the bad ones, which fortunately weren't too many. Um, and they kind of fell into really under the category of products with no APIs. Um, so we have things like, um, I guess like student record system. We needed to get data about which students were enrolled on which modules. Uh, so we had to resort to kind of like a nightly batch process. Um, similar kind of product problems with the VLE as well, getting kind of real time kind of stream of data from the VLE was quite difficult. Um, but I kind of come up with a couple of hypothetical um, kind of bad APIs. So, I could probably name and shame products here, but I probably won't because I'll get sued because it's all being kind of broadcasted over the web. But products where you kind of buy them and then the API is an optional extra, you're gonna cough up a bit of extra money to get access to the API. I think if you've bought a product, the API should come free. Um, and APIs that are kind of over-engineered, too difficult to use. Um, APIs ideally should be as easy as possible, um, yeah. If the documentation is more than a sheet of A4, then that's probably probably too hard. Um, in terms of the ugly APIs, um, the ugliest one we had to work well was the OPAC, uh, which didn't have an API. Well, it's not a true API, but again, there's a lot of useful information kind of buried in the library catalog that would be useful to, to kind of pull into the software. Um, so this is what our OPAC looks like today. Um, I'm sure others in the room have got the same. Um, OPAC software. Um, there's kind of a back door into it. Um, I don't know kind of how many people, I don't know who discovered this, but if you kind of stick this on the end of any URL, instead of getting a web page, you get the XML. How cool is that? Um, so it's kind of very ugly XML, but it's easier to work with than trying to screen scrape a web page. Um, so it's kind of a back door into the OPAC. So ugly but functional. Uh, number two is data. Um, where it gets ugly. Data ownership. Um, can you use, reuse, remix the data from you getting from the APIs from the suppliers? Um, if we save copies of this data locally, what happens when we cancel the vendor product? These kind of very kind of woolly areas. I tend to not lose sleep over these things. Perhaps I should, I don't know. Um, and I kind of kind of apologies for your solutions for this one, um, but this is the API documentation for 360 Link, uh, which is a document that I don't think has changed since 2007, um, which is fine, I mean, that's cool. Uh, but if you go down to the usage restrictions, I kind of think somebody's possibly kind of put that in and then forgot to go back and figure out what the usage restrictions would be. Um, so again, I tend not to worry too much as long as I'm kind of not breaking the API, as long as somebody from the company's not ringing me up saying, why are you crashing our servers, then I guess the usage is okay. Uh, the last one is really that, that many standards around for um, kind of data that you get from APIs. Um, so again, maybe, I guess as a developer, each API you work with, you've got to get your head around the 
kind of data it's going to provide. Um, you don't, Amazon a API doesn't expose the same kind of data uh, that you'll get from another, uh, say from Copac. Um, so those kind of be issues. I don't know if it's how feasible it is to try and come up with some kind of standards. Uh, I know there has been kind of work in the past. Uh, I think the DLF has done work on standardizing um, the kind of data that will come from an API. Um, so I think that's pretty much me done. Um, so I'm just going to summarize. Um, so APIs allow developers to enrich library services and to rapidly develop new ones, uh, and also to glue different services and products together. Uh, and essentially, you get the data to flow. So I kind of showed some examples where data flows from the API live into the interface. Um, and if you're kind of looking to buy new products, um, kind of questions you should be asking, does it have a really good fully featured API? Uh, really interesting one is, is the product itself built on top of the API? Um, the best APIs I've worked with have been that kind of scenario where the vendor product itself is built on top of it. Sometimes call it eat, um, eating your own dog food um, or drinking your own champagne, I've heard it as well. Um, is the documentation publicly available? Can you look at the documentation before you buy the product, give that to your developers and say, does this look like a good API? And kind of really cool, it's kind of like, I guess, when you take up references, when you kind of get somebody in to build a new bathroom or whatever. Um, can you kind of show me what other libraries have done with your API? What cool things have they done? And that is me done. I kind of hope a little bit ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, any questions for Dave? Uh, just to be sure that I have it right, do the academics put in the reading stuff themselves into the reading lists? They do. This has they been do. A, a big challenge. We, as I say, the library we don't have staff pro problems. Um, so we knew from day one this needed to stand by itself. It needed to be something that the academics, um, it's kind of the same with everything, that um, not everybody likes change. So um, I would be lying if I said every academic loves it. Um, there are some who've kind of maybe passed on updating reading lists to um, somebody else in the department or maybe kind of an administrative person. Um, but in, by and large, academics seem to be kind of quite happy updating their own list. And it's kind of great because I know for a lot of other libraries in the UK, it's been library staff who are kind of charged with updating reading lists. Um, and yeah, I'd say we just don't have the staff to do that. Very, very loosely. So students, when they log into their modules on the DLE, um, there's always a reading list link, uh, which then goes, um, because we kind of structured the URLs so they mirror the module codes, then just kind of sends them to that link and they see their reading list straight away. Um, students are kind of seem to be very keen to be able to kind of see reading lists ahead, so they want to know what books they would need to read if they studied this module next year. So that's kind of something we're looking at at the moment, is making um, a kind of list of modules you might be interested in studying and what reading that would require. Okay, anything more? More questions? No. Okay, then, yeah, that was the second day of our conference, and uh, see you all at the conference dinner at half past seven. <laughs>